It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, we were chatting in the back. Uh, how, long has, uh, how, have you, how long have you been in New York, both of you? We met in New York in 2004. Well, I, we, I moved here in 1997. Then we met in 2004, lived here for about a year, went to Los Angeles for about nine years, and then we've been here for about two and a half now, back for good. Yep, sold our place in LA. How about Our that? Own. We well, love it here. I know, I know you love it here. I just think New York is... It's it. It's it. It's it. There and is a heartbeat here. Yeah. There is a pulse and an electric, electric sense here that is just undeniable. And, and with our family and with our kids, it's such a different experience being in Los Angeles where you're, you're in pods. You know, you're in a car and That's you go true. in your pod to your place. It's very but, isolating, and, really. And then you're in your park <clears throat> and you play, it's fun. And then you get in your pod and you go to your restaurant for lunch and then <laughs> they take your car away and you eat lunch. And it's, it's okay if, if it's, if it's, if it's uh, anything but Georgie. Georgie's great. Thank you. So Georgie's great, yeah. but great. I don't know. There's, some, there's just something about, about living in the city and I think that New York does that almost better than I th any city I've been in the entire I think, world. You know, I just opened a restaurant in Beverly Hills, and it was kind of weird going there. It's kind of great, obviously, but because the weather's 80 degrees every day, it's perfect. And at 10 o'clock in the morning, you wake up, and it's kind of cloudy, or 9 o'clock, it's cloudy a bit. And then at 11, it's sunny, and it's perfect for the rest of the day, every single day of the year. But it's wild because there's no time passing. There's, there's no, no evolution. Time. I know. I, it's true. Four years went by when we were living there, and I said, Oh my God, what happened to four years? I've been here for four years, what's going on? My life, and going crazy. Merry Christmas, honey. <laughs> no, the problem is. And we swam on Christmas one day. And so how do, you know, how do you know when the seasons are in Los Angeles? Yeah. There's no seasons. So here, the tomatoes, I get them in July and August, yeah. a little bit maybe now, but then in, in LA you get them all the time. There's, there's tomatoes all the time. There's <laughs> lettuce all the time. It's a real odd thing. There's never snow. It's never cold. It's like, it's really bizarre. Then they string some lights up once in a while and you realize, oh, something's coming. It's holidays. It's a holiday. I like that. Uh, I like the seasons passing because of the weather change and the sort of the too. difference, but I also I like too. it food wise. I think on a culinary level, it's fun to, to go and you, you're a farmer's market guy. So you go uh, constantly and get what's in season, and, the, and some things aren't in season all year long. And so they you aren't. go, oh, it's, it's artichoke time, fantastic. Ramps. Speaking of chef. <laughs> There's ramps this week. Speak, speaking of food, let's talk a little food. I want to start Let's with talk David. food. Okay. My I have all these notes subject. here. I'm just going to throw these away in a minute. Um, first of all, David, you are a talented chef and actor. Oh. Uh, this gentleman has worked. Hold on a second. <laughs> they told me to say that. Nice. These are your notes. Oh. Um, you're right. You have trained, this is, this is the truth, you've trained at Meyer Batali's Babo, Thomas Keller's French Laundry, as well as with Iron Chef Kat Cora. How about that? Yeah. And you have a catering company called Gourmet MD. Did. Did. You sold it. Yeah. Smart man. For two billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> For two cents. <laughs> okay, so you have, your stage credit includes Broadway Gypsy and Who is Sylvia with TV credits that include How I Met Your Mother, everybody. <laughs> An American Horror Story. Most recently, we were just chatting about this. Anybody watch his new show on Food Network titled Life's a Party with David? Ever seen that? Amazing. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, Neil, my friend here. Uh, yeah, well, it's just. I'm going to read what it says, okay? And then you okay. can correct me. Okay. okay. Does it say I'm a talented actor? And it chef? says you're a talented actor and chef. Oh, no, that's David. <laughs> okay. TV, film, voiceovers, and stage. The voiceovers, you know, Cloudy with Meatballs too. did you see that? Good. Cla can you do a little bit for me? Cloudy with me? Can, can, uh, Steve. They yeah, always say, Steve! <laughs> That's it. I was a <laughs> monkey. So was it, and you got paid $2 million for I it. was a monkey that You're had a, a voice recorder on his, uh, and everything he said spoke out the thing. So I just had to go into a recording studio every once in a while and go, Gummy Bears! <laughs> Gummy Bears! <laughs> Love it. Love it. So you're uh, right. It's talent. You're working on something right now with Netflix, uh, a series of unfortunate events. Can I you am, talk yeah. about that in Olaf? It's fascinating. Uh, can I talk about it in Olaf? You mean? No, you're Olaf. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's talk a, about it as Olaf. Daniel Handler wrote this uh, uh, 13 book series called A Series of Unfortunate 13 Events. 13 books. Um, uh, written as Lemony Snicket. Um, there were 
oh, 12 or 13 years ago, I think, they, they came out with them. And they're fantastic books. Um, they made a movie of, of them, uh, a sort of truncated version of the first five or six books sort of smashed together into a movie that Jim Carrey starred in as Count Olaf. And Netflix is doing a um, three-season sort of limited series of it. Uh, so each season will be four or five books to get to the 13. We finished the first season. I play Count Olaf. And it's just been a wild ride. I can't wait for everyone to see Where it. Where was it filmed? We filmed it in Vancouver for the better Beautiful. part of five and a half months. Beautiful. And it's crazy. I've never, uh, I'm, I've never really played the villain as uh, older and as so sort of um, overtly. It's a lot of prosthetics. It was about two and a half hours of prosthetics every morning. Oh. So that was like 4.30, 5 a.m. calls to get there on set to do it. And the first book is Count Olaf uh, trying to steal these children's dowry because their parents die and left, leave them a fortune. And then he is uh, discovered and, and runs away. And then book two, he comes back, clearly Count Olaf, but now disguised as a different character. Um, and then he, and that happens and he's taken away. And then in book three, a different character. So every book in every two episodes will be a different version. So it, I've gotten to play a lot of different strange characters with different voices. It's very weird and Lon Chaney. And and what, I've, I've seen the first two episodes and it is remarkable. Thanks. What, what um, the director has done Barry Sonnenfeld, Barry Sonnenfeld directs is, half the episodes, and he's uh, Men in Black, and phenomenal. He's, pheno he's our showrunner. So cool. I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. And Neil is killing it in this show. I mean, it's really. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that, but but you could say, go I'm watch. Killing it's children. Really, it's really cool. <laughs> trying to kill children. You're trying to kill children. I'm trying to trick children. Tr and then kill them. Me. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting evil. because it's it's a it's it's a pretty black and white series yeah. in that way. I mean, Olaf has to be a villain that's scary and mean enough that that the children are worried that for their safety. And in the first book and in the first episode, he's awful. He he drinks a ton and he he holds them up in his house and he makes them do all the chores and he slaps Klaus, the younger boy, across the face oh. and and and. The was only that on a plane? way to was that on a private plane coming from France. <laughs> no, that was. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to make it a kids series that was for kids, uh, and, and in doing so, disrespect the kids uh, by by trying to play it in a in a in a more saccharine kind of watered down way. Because I think the only way you can be a villain in a show, even if it's for kids, is to be mean enough to be a villain. To validate the villainry of it all. Villainry? Word? I don't know. You're asking me? <laughs> We're at the so, Y. Yeah, we so, know that. So Olaf is awful, and it's, and it's super fun, and Netflix is great. They, they, they give you creative control to do all of them without meddling. They're all going to be released at the same time. You can binge watch all wow, of them, it's and great. it's super duper cool. Can't wait. Yep, thanks. Can't wait. Well, plug. Speaking of children. You have two incredible children, Harper and Gideon, and I, I, they sent me a... Do you was, say so? They were. And they sent me... Uh, how old are they? They're almost six. But, Birthday's almost coming six. up. October 12th. And they sent me a video. You texted me a video of them eating at Georgie, and they were critiquing my food. <laughs> 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 this is the best scallop I've ever had, and I love how the corn goes with the scallop. And it was like... And you weren't telling me what to say. They were, they were <laughs> saying that, and it was like so fantastic. So... You got, I read your bios a thousand times, and we talked about that. I got up in the middle of the night and read them again. They're just so voluminous. Your work, you, both of you are so busy. How do you balance, chill, I mean, I have three kids. How, how, how in God's name do you balance your life, look so great, be in such great shape, <laughs> do all this incredible stuff? <laughs> how do you do it? How, what, what, what is this? There's no secret, but what it, what, what it is that you do to make it work? Cocaine. All right. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's not. Just for the kids. <laughs> Snuff is good, actually. No, I mean, I think there's a Come balance. On. Like, you know, I mean, you've got three kids. You've got a million restaurants, 18 different shows. You, 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 you have no choice. When you, Neil has a good analogy. When, when, when things are happening to you, you get on that wave. And you've got to ride that wave. True. And, and, and so I, I think the fact that we are busy makes us able to 
manage our time a little bit better. I mean, you, you have to manage it and you have to have, of course we have help. We have people helping us out all the time. And- But you have to manage them. So of course, yeah. but, but we, we really take family dinners and weekends and, and, and going, driving them to school every single, not driving them, taking them to school every single day and trying to pick them up. And we would try to be there when we can, but when they're away in their lessons or their school, we are working our butts off. And when they go to bed, we're working our butts off. I mean, we do get some downtime, but, but you know, that's what the summer's for, so. Yeah, it makes for a, it makes for a, a less productive sleep cycle. It does. Because you get about, you know, five and a half, six is good. But, Daddy, um, Daddy. <laughs> five when I met morning. David, he had already been in a relationship with a gentleman who had, uh, had gone through the surrogacy process and, and, and was raising twins of his own. And David helped raise them and, and had gone through this parental thing. And then the, the boyfriend after that, um, that's a very close friend of ours, wanted to have kids with David. And he's a great parent and he always I'm a wanted. fertile boyfriend. <laughs> he he's just he's he, kids are, are sort of drawn to him and him today and and I have always wanted to uh, parent and I've always thought that was a super uh, real possibility when I was younger I didn't quite realize that that could be an actuality and so we live in a time now where that was able to happen in a way that um, that validates uh, the kids and our importance and their importance and I don't know I think I lived the myopic life for a really long time where I was just really concerned with lunch and and where to go for drinks that night and like what and w what was going to happen to me and having kids has just been great on on just multiple levels it's fun to watch them grow they just started kindergarten last week and that's such an amazing hurdle. Amazing. And, and then to see that, even within the week of kindergarten day one to kindergarten end of week one, their vocabulary is changing yeah. because they're now with kids who are their age but, but advanced in ways that they aren't. And you see their brains working in ways that they're not. And, and I just am so fascinated by that and, and I'm so proud to be a part of them and so proud to be a part of him that the lack of sleep and, and trying to fit it all in just sort of happens, you know? It's okay, you just deal with it, right? Yeah, and, and we have no choice, really. No. And we're we give them back? <laughs> <laughs> We've tried. <laughs> we, we use food as, as a real... It, 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 yeah, it, it's everything. It is everything, everything for us. And so their palates have been a real important thing to David. And we didn't want to, he didn't want to feed them canned baby food. We never did. He went and, and steamed carrots and, and, and mixed them up and added some herbs to them when they were tiny babies. Curry. And we've been eating sushi with them forever. And they love oysters. And we just think fresh fish is good. And they said to me in the car, you don't even know this, yesterday, we were driving to school and they said, Papa, I'm Papa. He's Daddy. They said. <laughs> they said, Papa. Thanks for clearing. Do you up. ever think when we get older that we'll eat at McDonald's? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> like, like it was some achievement. <laughs> and, and I said, Well, I'm sure you probably will want to. McDonald's food is delicious. The problem is you haven't eaten any McDonald's food up until now, right. and when you do eat it it'll taste good and then you'll probably get a stomach ache from right. it. And that won't feel good. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of on you. They, they, but we, David's true with dinners. We do family dinners as much as we can. <clears throat> and at family dinners, we go around and say what we've done during the day. And I think we get to use food as um, an equalizer mm -hmm. because we want them to try everything, even if they don't like it. And, and David can cook. He's a short order cook in the mornings, oh. which is so annoying to me. Much to my chagrin. That's what I do. It's same. I'm the same person. No, no, and no. Yes, yes. yes. Ask my wife. She's here. Here's the thing. In the morning, the kids get up. They're supposed to go and get fucking cereal. <laughs> no. They're not supposed to have a parent that says, what do you guys want for breakfast? And they sit and ponder and then say, I'm thinking avocado toast <laughs> with a drizzle of a, a, a nice extra virgin olive oil, a soft boiled egg in, in a, a lion cup today, and uh, toast points cut up, and do you have any fresh tomatoes from the rooftop? No. I'm like, fuck you, have, you're supposed to have cereal. <laughs> 
And the reason I, it upsets me is because when he's not there, when I, I I'm slept like, in once. <laughs> I, last week I slept in and I heard I heard commotion downstairs and he let me sleep in so nice. But I have a, I have a hard time. If someone's up, I'm up, you yeah. know. Yep. Uh, and so I come down and Neil's in the kitchen going, I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I did they want scrambled eggs and I'm trying. I was like, okay, go, go. So you have created. Go make me coffee. You have created snobs. We've awful. creating snobs. It's all awful. Of us. No, it's, it's terrible. Awful. I mean, I it's just... honestly though not snobbery. That's the that's the ironic thing. It's, it's just what it is. It's, it's not. It's not this pretentious no. thing. They they like good fresh simple stuff. Fresh simple food that Which I can make. Which takes time to cook. And I tell, <laughs> no, but I tell people it's really true that you create all your memories. I believe. I don't know if you believe this, but I think you create all your memories around the table. I mean, mm. That's what life's about, mm. right? It is. It's, and, and your children well will grow up and mimic you because they want to mimic the, the daddy, mommy, whatever happens there at the table. How dare you, sir? That's all. <laughs> the daddy, poppy. And they want to mimic that, and that's how you create poppy, a memory. And that's what you want to do. And, and today, to this day, I mean, every day, is like, it's, like, it's like a SWAT team making breakfast. And they expect all this stuff, and it's the same at my but house. But can't you just say today we're having scrambled eggs, and you make that? What, this whole, this yes. whole... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But they're over a double boiler, right, David? A double boil, some salt. <laughs> you whip the eggs. Yeah. You, you whip French the, butter? Yeah, exactly. French butter. Do a little soft peak on the, white, uh, the whites. I love this guy. I hate you both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, okay, let's talk about your new show, Life's a Party. Let's. Come on, Food Network. <laughs> Everybody here is from Food Network. Where are you? They're all here. Somewhere. Good. So, no one showed up. They're here. <laughs> Tell us about the show. Beautiful well, show. Oh, it's great. I, you know, I was doing. We we were asked to be on Ina Garden show, Barefoot Contessa. If you know who she is. Yes, do we know who she is? The Queen. The, the Queen. And um. Best and, cookbooks. Uh, she's the best cookbooks. Foolproof. That's true. Foolproof. Moly. Well, she also. She also. Amazing. Great guacamole. Great guacamole. Great guacamole. Great guacamole. Um. But she, we were guesting on her show, and her producers came up to me. They, they said, you know what? You're really natural at this. Would you ever want to do a food show? And I thought, oh, I'm acting right now. I don't know. And then about three months later, it was still sitting with me. And I called up Rachel, uh, one of the producers at Pacific, and I said, you know what? I think, I think it's time to do something. She goes, great. Let's take a meeting. We took a meeting, and she said, let's do this thing. So she... We made a, we contacted the Food Network. They said that they wanted to be a part of it. So they greenlit a pilot, a special, we call it, and we made this pilot. And I Great. really wanted to be sort of a slice of life, lifestyle of what our life is. I mean, what you saw on the pilot is how we, how we entertain. Uh, honestly, when we were having dinner with our friends James and Kelly and Rachel, and um, that's, it, we forgot that the cameras were there at one point. It felt so much like what we really do in our life. And I mean, that's what I do. I, I love putting um, special occasions together and I love going above and beyond and making pe people feel really special. So that's, that's sort of what it is. And, and I want it to be accessible recipes for people in middle America, feel like they don't have to tackle some big job and little, little things where they're decorating tips or maybe one day we'll work on what you should wear or maybe what games to play or maybe a playlist or decorations or, or something like that. A little, little things, how to make your party special. And it will be all about parties and, and hopefully you guys will all watch. It's yeah, amazing. It's one of my... It's one of my favorite things about David is that when, when he is stressed or uh, concerned or upset, he goes and cooks. I do the same thing. You know what I mean? And, and he does that because he cares about the immediacy of making people happy. And, and, and he will put his time and energy into something that takes a lot of time because he's caring about the end result. Which is interesting as actors because what we do is kind of weirdly the same because we're performing, but most often you perform on, uh, in front of a camera crew that's not giving you any response and you don't get any response at all until a year later when the something comes out or you are per performing for a casting director who says, thank you, we'll let you know. And then you don't really <laughs> or, hear or much Or you're of anything, on Broadway right? and you do it and then you're in it so much that you forget it and you're like, what did I just do? Yeah, there's re repetition. I, I really felt with, with the acting thing, it, 
it was great and I loved it and it served its purpose in my time. But now with the kids, it's really hard to do eight shows a week and, and go off on, on location and, and, and not be there for them. So I really wanted to be there. So I started cooking for a, a different reasons, but it makes me feel so good. I love it. And it's what just you in put its in, bones to do it. What you put in into a dish is right there in front of you. And the proof is right there, and you can see it, and you can taste it, and you can feel it inside your body, f making you feel. And that's what I just love about cooking. But here's where I think the show is cool, because what David isn't is a, a owner of five restaurants around the country that he's done, and the Food Network has a ton of those. But what David is, is someone who is incredible with sort of improvisational cooking, and he can throw a party or a lunch or something with, with no, w under very quick circumstances and make it above and beyond what you would think it would be. So he can do something. Anyone can throw a party if they have two weeks to prepare for it because you can sit there and, sure. and slowly plan it. But he can, if, if ingredients are off, he can improvise and come up with a way that it's still gonna be delicious. And I'm, I hope that that speaks to the audience of the Food Network because I think there's a, there's a market for that person who, who has a party to throw for eight people and is sort of overwhelmed by the concerns about how to make that a perfect party. And he's really good, at, and especially the kids are in it, and I'm in it, and, we, and I think what's fun about the show is we just kind of come and go and wander and screw things up, and he's just a little frazzled by it, but, we but want it's it to fun, be, no. and then he fixes it and changes it. Well, it's not, okay, we now it's gonna it to be We want it to be messy. That. We want, you know, the, the, if the, we're making a gravy and the gravy's too loose, oh, well, all you need is some more, some more flour and just thicken it up. Things like that that people don't really know necessarily. How to sort of think on your feet and if you make a mistake, how you clean it up? How do you, how do you bounce back from things that happen at a party? It's why I can't cook because I feel like I'm only successful if I'm looking at a cookbook and I'm exact <laughs> with my measurements and everything. And if something goes wrong, I can't fix it. Well, so if you're, I think if that's you're a baker good. or a pastry chef, you have sure. to be pretty exact. Yeah. Sure. It that's sounds to me like, like acting and cooking is pretty much the same. I mean, it's like Broadway, three shows a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, it's like, well, yeah, it goes like, up, right? It's like you're performing, really. I honestly, it's a culinary arts, though, too. And every it day, is an art. Every day, your performance is slightly different. Every day, you know, you go to a restaurant, you get a good meal, you go back, it's like, yeah, it wasn't that good tonight. Yeah, for know? sure. I think it's the same kind. It's a lot of similarities. Improvisational acting is very much like cooking. Yeah. Because some people are so mired in the craft of what they do as an actor that they can only perform if the temperature is exactly what it needs to be and if this cup has to be positioned in a certain way for the and you're like oh my god well, get on with it well if you're and, working at a restaurant but, and you're on the line you're you're doing the same thing as over a, and over. eight shows a yeah. week you yeah, know yeah turn the weeds and then this is overcooked and you're getting yelled at and you have to make it again and there's a 20 top and there's suddenly this VIP person that comes in and you have to and you're banging stuff out. I mean, that's improv cooking to me in the same way that when you go to a good improv show and see the groundlings or you see UCB or someone do a show and they're being thrown stuff left and right and they can still make a great show out of whatever it is that they have in front of them. I think that's a great skill. Well, I think that sometimes, like, if you don't see the back of the house, we tell people never, sh you know, if you're in the shit, as we say. Yeah, the shit shits. Then, which means like, the, the shit's hitting the fan. You're, you're so behind. Out front, it could be like, you know, remember Ratatouille? The rats are every, uh, crawling over the place, and out back, the, the, the violin's playing, <laughs> people are drinking wine. No one knows. And that's how you have to, you sort of have to do that. You don't show people your dirty underwear. So if the night went good out front, you don't tell them how bad it went. You don't say, we're in the weeds, it was awful. The person had a great meal, and they left, like, wow, wasn't that lovely? And you're killing each other in the back of the kitchen, firing people. So that, that's what happens a lot in our business, honestly. How does it work for you with so many restaurants, though? Do you get... Do you get updated the next morning about what, how often you were in the shits yes. in Beverly Hills? Yes. Seriously, because you're not able. It's the only not thing like you have good one about the only thing right? good about Beverly Hills is three is three hours, it's three hours behind. So that I get updated at nine o'clock in the morning, which is six a.m., which is when they finish out. So that I get that. Like in New York City, I get updated at five o'clock in the morning my time. So I know exactly what happened, how many sales, how many covers. I read the whole manager's log, which is awful, especially when we're on the John. You're reading the manager's log, and you're like, oh my God, John had an awful meal. But does that mean that you, because we're fans of yours, and, and the fact that you're able to manage shows, restaurants, and then still go on and cook like st stupid, ridiculous food uh, on camera, uh, on a on, trade seat? in and out. No, 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 but, I, <laughs> but I'm interested in that because 
it, you, you can't be singular, and you, no, you now it's are... it's very hard. It's very hard. So how do you deal with when you, things are going badly? Do you, do they, you have they people... They go bad. They go bad, and people, you know, people make up excuses, and they make you feel better. And like, yeah, we're very sorry your meal is late, or, you know, we're, we're very sorry this happened. And yeah. you, you manage it. It's correct. It's like you correct it. It's just life is a, is a bucket of mistakes, and you just get over it somehow. And you do. I mean, it's like, it's live. Every night is live. Every single night, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, so... Yeah. It's, there's no tape, you know, let's stop. You can't put the curtain back down. You know, it's up, it's up. Yeah. And, and it's you're just, naked. And it's with, like rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing before it opens, and then when you open, it's, it's, you it's make this, running. You know what happens? You make the same mistakes that you, you got over, and you will never make those mistakes. The first day you make the same mistake, and that's what happens. You just get through it. Speaking of mistakes. <laughs> boom. Segway. Segway. Who is the best host of the Academy Awards ever? Have to get that out. Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never. So, uh, yes, absolutely. So who is going to host in 2017, you think? The Oscars? Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting question, because they went... James Corden. No, it's on ABC this year. Oh. So mm. it, every year it's on ABC. So that they would either use an ABC person. I thought Jimmy Kimmel did a great job at the Emmys. Um, but that may be double dipping in a way that the Academy might think is just too much. I would say they'd, they'd, do, they'd head towards diversity and maybe use an A-list actor uh, of some ethnicity that would be funny and relevant. Well, what I want to know is like, I, everybody here I know wants to know this, how in God's name do you prepare for that? Because for me, when I, wa when I see that, it's not like there's a certain amount of information that you get and here you go, prepare. The information comes hourly, daily, uh, it might be, because of some debate coming up. It just comes every, it's coming at you all the time. How do you pre prepare? And when you're at home, are you cooking for him? Is he going nuts? And what's the process? He was in Los Angeles and I was rehearsing a Broadway show. So it was a very crazy time. He was, he was gone uh, in LA uh, and I went. And so you're, you're all, you're we're, separate. We're separate, yeah. And it's, he, a year before he got the offer, it was nonstop, all the time, jokes and who he's going to get and what he's going to do. You do, do, you, do you do your own material, 100%? No. No. Well, yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you approve everything. You have a, 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 a list of writers, but he's 90%. You're 90% doing the ideas and the... <laughs> The job. I, mean, I, don't I take no ownership of being a writer of my own comedy at all. I have a specific style that I think is kind of, <laughs> is kind of glib and funny, and I, and I sort of know I'm a big fan of dad humor and puns okay. and, and stuff that's, that's wah, wah, but kind of silly, because I, I do feel that audiences that are, that are there live in their dresses and, and nervous with their names of people that they may have to say, but they probably won't, and they're all, there's a very weird energy in a room that I think those kind of fun, light jokes make them feel at home instead of mean, sort of acerbic mm -hmm. jokes. Uh, I don't, and, and it, at home, I don't know that they're as successful. They don't land at this, in, the, in the same way. Um, my path to, from hosting award shows has been very strange. I was asked to host um, the Ovation Awards, which is essentially the, the, the West Coast Theater Awards, non-televised, and it was many years ago, and I thought, oh, that's weird. Sure, that would be fun. <laughs> and so my friend Paul Greenberg, who's a writer and a funny guy, and I went and did it, and we had all these funny, dumb bits that we did, and it was fun, it was great. They asked us to host it, me to host it again the next year. And then it turned into the TV Land Awards. They wanted me to host mm -hmm. that the year after Kelly Ripa had done it. And that was televised and strange, but it seems so weird. You don't audition for any of this. You just kind of get this weird email or phone call. So I did that, and that was fun. And then just sort of slowly, then I was on CBS, and then CBS had the, M the Tony's. Tony's. And they asked me if I'd host the Tony's, which seemed was, was crazy. I loved Broadway and Three loved more the times, Tony's. Right? And so I did that, and that was really fun. And then it just, and then all of a sudden I had hosted the Emmys, which was weird. Then I video that, game, then I went, video, the game, video game, awards. game awards. There you go. <laughs> then the Porn Awards in Vegas. Big. Yep, yep. The Telemundo Awards. Tele <laughs> yeah. I and and I just thanks. Oh, Telemundo Awards. I'm sorry. Adults. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I, here, I don't man. speak Spanish very well. So then the Oscar thing comes up, and, I, and it's, it's a bucket list thing that it, it seems impossible to, to 
not want to do, and yet if you try, if you, if you say that you want to do it, it feels like you're pandering and trying to get the gig, and if you say you don't ever want to do it, that seems weird and odd too. So I said yes, knowing that it's a big, giant, sort of bullseye on the back of whoever hosts that show. I told him not to do it. You did? Yeah. Why? I think it's hard in that position. It's a hard show. It's a hard show. It's a hard room. It's no one, by this time, by the Oscars, all of those people have gone through a whole year from con to the Oscars doing the same interviews, the same questions, and everyone is exhausted. And no one necessarily wants to be there because the press line is two hours long. They sit in their chair and it's a four hour ceremony. And most of, those, most of those people have already and everyone knows they already know who's going to win, pretty much. How, already, why is that? How can that be? Well, because like, it's what the, about the it's briefcases the, and the no, it's handcuffs? The, no, I don't mean it that way. But it's the it's the twelfth or thirteenth award show in the movie year cycle. It's the last one. So the Golden Globes have happened. Mm -hmm. The People's Choice Awards have happened. The the DGA Awards have happened. The the Screen Actors Guild Awards have happened. Like all of these awards have happened. So if Julianne Moore has won eleven out of twelve, you know everyone who's nominated for Best Actress except for Julianne Moore is kind of going through the motions. They still have to look fantastic. They're gonna be judged on their dress. They can't eat for the week before. <laughs> they get there, they have to do the same interviews and pretend that they're super chipper when they pretty much know that Julianne Moore is gonna win. And then they sit there for four hours before they finally get to lead actress and then they don't win, right? So but, that's and it's a the lose, nice necessarily a lose-lose situation because um, you, the host is necessarily the one that's sort of shit on the next day. It's not about who won or whatever. It's, no. oh, well, did he do a good job? Did she do a good job? And, and I also feel like, depending I don't know, on but I will, I, let, me, let me, I have to break in there because I don't feel like people necessarily shit on the host. What, what I do think is interesting about the, the gig and a little masochistic about it is that you do spend a lot of time micromanaging just about everything. It's a gigantic audience of, of 100 million people that are watching it. And, and as soon as it's done, and the next day goes on, they're just thinking about the next movie that they're gonna see. So all of the, all of the time that you spend on it comes, hap happens as a one-off that is never ever even seen again. It's not a movie that you do that then you can right. watch later. It just goes away. You remember who won and who lost and a couple of things that went wrong and that's sort of the net you, you can't end prepare of it all. You can't do it again. Well, also, I think, it, I think the Oscars really determine if it's gonna be successful if the movies are successful that year. That's true, they sign up the host well before the movies are live. Locked. So you don't know if it's going to be an exciting year for movies. Ah! ah. <laughs> and I mean, if there's a thank you, my darling. I thought you were Chris Rock. If there, <laughs> if there's a way for you to see the movies <laughs> that are going to be there, then I think it's easier for the host to sign up because. You know, if there's a big blockbuster movies, people are probably going to tune in more. It's true, GZ. If I may. This was. This is how I would propose that one that they could uh, that they could make the Oscars a more a, a, a singularly more enjoyable telecast. I think they should add a category. I think they should take the best feature film category, mm -hmm. the big one, and they should split it into two. I think they should make the best blockbuster film, and they should make the best independent film. And I don't know what that line would be, mm -hmm. but money. Sure. But when you have How much it makes. when you have <clears throat> Star Wars: The Force Awakens going against Brooklyn, yeah, they're so yeah. different, and 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 there's so much talent that goes into a big giant movie like Guardians of the Galaxy or these big giant movies that that for some reason is sort of poo-pooed by the Academy, who are, are much more in line with these independent films. And so what's happening now, I think, is that, is that the producers know when to release an independent film that's starring two people and a breakout person right before the festival circuit so that they can get on the track to get, and all of a sudden you wind up with five or seven films that are nominated for best movie that most people haven't seen. Yeah. So you're, now we're seeing the Oscars where people are not seeing any of these movies. So the host is out there doing jokes about movies that most don't people see. don't understand the context of the joke, uh, I, I think at the expense of cinema. So that would be, that, that, that's the one thing that I would say would be fun to change. But, but that being said, I, I, I love watching them. So I, I would never say I didn't have a good time and I, and I, I, 
No, I love we go. We no, I love them I too. Love, I love I don't. dressing casually. I love, I love eating ch chips and queso and, and talking about how awful everyone looks and, <laughs> and, 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 and mocking how it all goes. That's kind of what you do for the Oscars. So. Well, movies are completely different than theater, and you both have been in so much theater. But I have a question about movies, if you don't mind. It's a very personal question. Okay. Oh. Okay. So editing and the camera, the viewer sees things that we might not want to see or we imagine what we're seeing. So you just did a, a movie which I thought was fantastic. Did anybody see Gone Girl? Mm. I, I was riveted and, and I thought I knew it was going to happen. I didn't. That was amazing. I, all I have to say is there was a involved scene between you and the... Yeah. Rosamund. Rosamund oh, yeah. Pike. Rosamund Pike, RP yeah. as I have it here. How do... <laughs> How do you prepare for a scene that's so intimate? And is there a body double? <laughs> no body doubles at all. It was David Fincher, who I'm a massive fan of, as the director of the movie, and, and, and he does unbelievable work. And if, you, and if you're lucky enough to be asked to join in, and play in that sandbox, you would be remiss to say that there are things that you didn't want to do. So, um, I was excited by the notion that I got to play someone who was twisted and dark and, and then ended up, uh, ended up in a very sexual situation uh, and a sort of shocking twist. It was shocking. Within, within the film. <laughs> uh, she slits my throat in the yeah. middle of, of us banging. Spoiler. Yeah. Banging. So, <laughs> just banging. I didn't say that. I'm here, just trying to like, not banging. talk around it, but it's on DVD, so. <laughs> If you missed it, that's what happened. So, did, did, so filming it was weird because. So how did you do? How do you do a, that? We're, like just, was, we're humping for days. <laughs> I always wonder, like, what? How, how does that happen? <laughs> you have three kids, right? Yes. <laughs> but not on camera. <laughs> oh. oh. Um, I mean, is it rehearsed? I'm serious. It's I mean, super duper rehearsed. Okay. And David Fincher, again, to his credit, he knows how to edit and he knows how cameras work and he knows uh, how, how to time a day. He knew that if we were fumbling around with the sex scene, that when he needed a shot at a specific time or when it was crucial to have something happen and we flopped on the bed in this direction and we didn't do the same thing both takes, he would have to choose between one or the other. So it was very important to him that the sex scene was rehearsed and rehearsed robotically for hours and hours and hours. And Rosamund and I went with him, we talked about it and he said what he wanted like very, very methodically then your pants go down and I want your hands around but not on his butt but like below his butt like that and then and then she's going to blow you but it's going to be like like four ins and outs <laughs> and then throw you back on the bed but throw you back I mean and and very would... similar to our <laughs> <laughs> So we just rehearsed so, it forever, and we were laughing because it just, we just, uh, let's comical. try it again, here we go, because, wow. and, and sure enough, it was great, because then... So it, you didn't wing it, I mean, this is practiced. Super, practiced super to, practiced. To, to, to what angle we were on and every number of things that happened, because at the end of it, it got really, really bloody, because yes. she slits my throat with a box cutter, and then I sort of bleed out while she holds on to me right after I reach orgasm, which is, which is intentional for her. So. So while that's all happening, there's just blood gushing everywhere. We're filming on a soundstage so that they could remove the walls back, replace the bed, replace the carpet. We completely showered and changed. They replaced all the bedding. They replaced, and then would all come and pop back in. And we'd do it again. And uh, and honestly, like that to me is why <clears throat> acting is fun, right? Because. <laughs> No, I mean that super serious. What have I, I done? <laughs> no, I spent I spent a lot of time here talking it, uh, <laughs> in great detail, weirdly, about the Oscars and hosting and about I about the food show and things like that. And that's all fun, but it's it's in a sort of sp safe space. You know, there's something there's something weirdly intimate and dangerous about about being nervous in front of David Fincher and trying to execute your fucking A plus game. Yeah in a situation that's foreign to you, because I don't know R Rosman very well, but I have to act, and we're doing something very intimate and very physical and, and dying, which you're clearly acting. <laughs> <laughs> but having to do that over and over 
at that level was, it was I, I was in the big leagues, you know, I felt like I was yeah. really, play, I, was, I was playing hard. And so I really liked doing that, it was fun. Creepy, but fun. <laughs> okay, audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> Beat that audience. Are you ready? Okay, this is for you, Neil. Uh, you have co-hosted live with Kelly a few times. Mm. And I was just there, I had a great time last week, by the way. Do you want to be her permanent co-host? If not, who should be? Nice. Nice question. Um, we're both very good friends with Kelly and Mark, and, and our kids and their kids get along super well. So we see them socially a lot. Um, and so anytime they ask me to come and play, it's a super fun gig. Uh, but I have no interest at all in doing it all year long. It's a hard show. You've got to be there all the time. Well, they, they offered it. They offered it to you. Oh. I don't know my... That's so absolutely not true. They, <laughs> they well before the, in, Michael, before the Michael Strahan before Michael chapter Strahan. had happened, oh. we, had, were, we had were talked about the possibility of would that even be a possibility. They wanted to And even back then, I, what, I, what I'm a big fan of and what I'm proud of most about my professional life is the diversification and, and the, the fact that I get to do theater and movies Everything. and TV and all over the, and I get to go all over the place. And now that we have a family, I have no interest in just having to be in one place. I'm doing this Netflix show that's in Vancouver for almost half the year, and after that, I don't know what happens. And so <clears throat> to commit to something where you're doing pretty much all year long, Can't you have it. to be, you could do yeah. something in the afternoon, but you couldn't go do a Star Wars movie. If the, I'm not doing a Star Wars movie, but I'd love to. And if that, you know, something like that would be super amazing fun too. So who would I think would be best? I think yeah. Anderson Cooper, Cooper would be the perfect host for that yes. show. Yes, I agree. Because, and here's why. Because Anderson is so awesome and nice and funny, but his job requires him to sit and read and be so I in the middle because he's, requ you know, he's, he's required to tell the news. Yeah. That's what he does. But he has so many fun opinions. So when you see him at the, at the New Year's thing with Kathy Griffin, it's fun to see him cutting loose. And if, I think it would be so fun to see Anderson in the morning with Kelly hanging out, being himself, and not having to really be doing hard-hitting news every day. That's a great answer. David, this is for you. What are your favorite go-to restaurants in New York City? Oh. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Thanks, Tom. Oh, man. Oh. Lamb's Club. <laughs> Thank you again, Tom. <laughs> Butter. Butter. Butter's great. Butter. Um, Butter. There, uh, there's a lot of them. I mean, up there depends on what it is. You know, we, um, we up. Uh, we live up in Harlem, so we order Street Bird a lot from Seamless. We love yes. Marcus Samuelson. We live right around the corner from Red Rooster, so yep. that place yeah, is fantastic. Sylvia's is great up there. I, I, I love going to Batali's restaurants. I mean, oh. The thing about New York is that you can go to so many great places, and, and the takeout is, you know, just Chinese you know takeout. I mean, it's, What it's about cuisines? What about uh, Thai food? Uh, Uncle about, Boone's. Uncle Boone's is fantastic. Uncle Boone's. Well, give me some more. Uh, what about Chinese food? Uh, Chinatown, uh, going down to, oh, what's that place called? I don't know what it's called, but I know but how to get Even to Chinese it. takeout, like you said. Yeah, really. you can go What about there. Italian food? Oh, that's a hard one. Hard uh, one. Like, you can go high end or low end. I, I, love, I love Lupa because it's so cash. And you get those big communal tables, and you get a big group over there, and Upland's great. Um, oh, what so about, what about? Carbone is great. What about Bobby Flay's? Uh, that oh, Gato. Oh, Gato, Gato is great. Gato's really fantastic. Good. That's more Spanish, Mediterranean, though. Agreed. Mexican food. Uh, Toloache. Toloache is great. Yeah. That's yeah. delicious. So, thanks, I Tom. love nachos. Nachos. Mia loves nachos. Oh, I'm from Albuquerque, man. Green chili, anything. Oh. My so the kids, the kids, how old are the kids? Six, seven, six, six almost six. in October. So yeah. what do you pack for lunch? They have lunch at school. They have chefs. Yeah. Oh, it was that question. Michael, Ma Michael Anthony comes in and, and, and cooks for them. Wow. Michael Anthony's kids go to... Gramercy Tavern, another great restaurant. Dalton, so... Dan Barber, also his kids went there. He's a graduate of Dalton, so they know food there. Lucky. We, we send our kids to a school up here on the Upper East Side, and they have a published chef. I was like, wow. guy, it's fantastic. That's it's fantastic. great, right? It's just amazing. What's your Very new lucky. favorite restaurant? Are you allowed to say? Yeah, what's your favorite? I can say what I want. Uh, <laughs> My new favorite restaurant. God, there's just so many. So it's many. Ridiculous. Which? What does oh, that mean? Oh, who's in that? Are you calling me? I names? hear a little bird in the audience. Cuckoo. Cuckoo. 
Is Cuckoo the name of a restaurant? The Cuckoo. I've been there downtown at Daniel Rose's new place. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Which is great. Is it it's American? Like bar, it's like you sort of sides. You don't know Daniel Rose. Is an American who 15 or 20 years ago moved to Paris from Chicago uh, and opened this little restaurant called Spring in Paris. And it was, you know, daring because this, who's this American to come to our country? Uh. You open know, a restaurant. Uh. <laughs> and he got like two Michelin stars and they, you know, he has this tiny restaurant. He just, he just, he's a cook. It's a very simple food. And uh, Stephen Starr brought him here and opened up Cuckoo down in Saxon, China, wow. close to Chinatown, on, uh, down on uh, Lafayette. I know. And it's great. Got it. You'll, you'll love it. Very if you simple. can say anything you want, what's your least favorite restaurant that just opened? Oh, uh, <clears throat> don't make him do that. I won't do that. <laughs> I will not do that. I'm just kidding. All right, to <laughs> uh, Mr. Burke and Mr. Harris. Yes, present. Aside from spending time with your kids, what's your ideal Saturday night? Sleeping. <laughs> Night. We, we, I, we, I really love uh, getting together with Neil, the kid, putting the kids down, making some popcorn, and watching a movie. Like really, we're simple stuff. Since we, since we, have gotten older, <laughs> we really love the downtime. It's so nice just to chill out, maybe watch some crappy TV, and and go to bed early. Honestly, for me. I mean, also, it's fun to have friends over and, and make a dinner and, and, and just have fun and maybe play some games, but that never happens anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're too busy rehearsing My those God. movie scenes. I would say like 5.30, margarita and chips and guacamole ah, at Toluache and then go to see Hamilton, mm. and then oh. after that, go have dinner at, Love that. Uh, oh, we were just talking about it backstage, Ralph Lauren's place. Oh, oh the, Lauren's, polo yeah, polo the Polo Club. The Polo Club, that was that super fun. Great. We did that so fancy, and there were all these fancy people, in. celebrity people there, and you're like, oh, snap, there's so-and-so sitting across. <laughs> snap. And then, I uh, love their, that. Go to sleep. That corned beef sandwich is fantastic. I it dream is. about that's that. That's the they give away it. They just say here. It's I think that's my favorite. Good. Going to a restaurant and oh, yes. sitting and, and not ordering anything on the menu is telling the, wait, telling the waiter that's what to I do tell all the, the time. chef, just p please bring us food that you think would be good. We were, to eat. we were out with our son. I love, it. I love it. We were out with Gideon once and he told the waiter, we were like, let's just get stuff. Let's just get stuff from the menu. So Gideon, I, I said, Gideon, why don't you order? He, he looked at the waiter, he said, wow us. <laughs> The waiter was like, what, what's going on? What? I don't know. What is this wow us? What? Wow us. Is this a fish? It's a fish. Look, wow us. Wow us. So, you, <laughs> this is for you, Neil. Okay, That's so right. Times Square, you're now coming to Times Square. Thanks a lot. We need another restaurant there. You're a co-creator of a magic theme immersive theater and nightlife project. Yeah. Please tell me about that. Please do tell. And you're getting into the restaurant business. Not really. Well, not really. Kind of. Well, kind of. Um... I'm joining forces with the gang uh, who did uh, The Box and uh, Sleep No More mm -hmm. and Queen of the Night. And they uh, bought a, a rented a space. They've leased a, a property on 57th Street between 8th and 9th, which was once called Pro Providence. And, uh, oh, yes, I it's know. It's a big space. A big event yeah. space. And they want to do um, a new show, have a new venue that's got some magical elements to it. So they asked me to uh, come on board with my production company, Prediction Productions, and, um, and help co-create and co-direct a show. Uh, the interesting thing about immersive theater is that by design, it's, 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 there's no box with which to form. It's not based on any uh, previous material the way Sleep No More is based on Macbeth. Right. We're really coming up with a new idea and through, it becomes very nebulous and, and changes a lot. So what was once very Sleep No More with lots of walk through rooms and have one-on-one -on -one experiences and meet a cast of people who have backstories and interactions with each other and very dance-based thing is, is now sort of shifted into maybe a, a, a simpler variety-ish type of thing of an interesting, with an interesting take on it. I think there's something to be done in that realm south of the uh, Columbus Circle, but north of, of the Broadway world because thousands and thousands of people get out of their shows around 10, 30, 10, 40, do do? and they don't know where to go. And I think there's a great audience to go somewhere. So we're, we're, 
we have an idea for a show that would happen from 8 to 10.30 as a show that you could see, and then you could stick around and you would see acts that would happen within the, these spaces after that. But yeah, I'm very into magic, and uh, a friend of mine, Derek Delgadio, had his show in, in uh, LA that was a big sold out thing called, uh, well, it's gonna be coming here soon. We did, I directed him in a show called Nothing to Hide, and uh, I'm a big fan of just people watching magic. I think magic's super cool. Very so. cool. You need a chef? Well, it's weird. We met with some chefs for it because it was originally going to be a, a dining experience. <clears throat> Funny, I missed that call. <laughs> you were knee deep in Beverly Hills oh, when we were having those excuse. conversations. Oops. And so, and it has a very small ish kitchen. So we're even reconsidering the no dinner theater is a very interesting I nut love it. to crack. It's hard, but I love it. It's no one super does hard because yeah. you have people with their own culinary ideas of what is worth the money that they're spending. So when you're, when you're combining food and theater, then what's your price point? Do you go a hundred, do you do $200 right. for the, the, the evening show, which would be a hundred and a hundred bucks anyway, plus a hundred bucks for a meal. But if you're sitting down and you paid $200, then you want really, really good food. And in a theater experience with a smallish kitchen, you're not going to provide really great food. And if you provide mediocre food, then the show is going to suck because everyone's going to be sitting there feeling like that they've been they're hungry. Off. And then you, so you, that's a very hard one to So cook. what are you going to do? What do you think? Uh, I suspect that the, that the food thing will be marginalized a lot. It'll probably be more of a show and drinks and maybe some small bites of things that you can get of an interesting style. I don't want to give away too much because, again, it's not set in stone what we're doing. But I think our take on variety and magic right now as it sits would be, would be certainly something that hasn't been seen before. And I think the food would be dictated by that. Wow. I'm very excited. Cool. In my hood. All right. We're going to end with a little word association game. Goo. All right, James Lipton. Come on. <laughs> really? I'm just kidding. OK. Um, this, you can both, same time, one or the other, you can answer this okay. as a collective or as separate. Or I would like each one of you to answer separately. How about we do every other one? But that's a cop out, but OK. OK. <laughs> every other one? Well, I'm just saying. You, go, he's for, you say, go first on this one. He's going to say something, okay. then it's going to take me to another place. Oh, interesting. Well, that might be more fun then. Let's do okay. that. Okay. Okay. David, you're first. Holidays, Christmas or Halloween? Christmas. Ooh. Halloween. <laughs> oh, you're going to? Okay. Halloween. And who are you going to be this year? We do a big family Halloween costume thing every year, so we, 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 like, to, we like to not uh, reveal it until Halloween happens, okay. and we hope that our children will play along. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the works. I don't know if it's going to happen. All right, um. this is for you, uh, Neil. Toast, light or dark? Light. Uh, David, light. reading with light? Yeah. Both light. Yeah, just a little spongy in the inside, but crisp on the outside. Got it. Dark toast, I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> Got it. Uh, reading, paper or digital? Paper. Yeah, man, one of my first jobs was working in a bookstore. So I love paper. I love the smell of books and pages, yeah. and I love, I love organizing books by size and type. I just spent the last three days so paper. literally doing that. So paper, for sure. Chocolate, milk or dark? Milk. 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 <laughs> Mr. Dark. <laughs> Milk? Milk. 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 Alcohol. Tequila or gin? Tequila. Tequila. Fitness, yoga or weights? Oh, gotta have both, sorry. <laughs> I uh, say yoga. Yoga. Really? I'm more interested yoga. in... Yoga. Yeah. I see a bunch of people at the gym who care more about weights, and I worry that they're just gonna end up old with man boobs. <laughs> I think practical strength is the way to be. Those Cirque du Soleil people who look like they're, they're scrawny people in t-shirts and jeans, but, but they could really, do a slow press yeah. into a one-handed handstand. Yeah. That's what I aspire to do. So what do you do. both do? You work out, obviously. What do you do, David? Uh, I do a mix. Uh, uh, yoga, I, I love Soul Cycle. You do? That's so much fun. I take Soul Cycle every Friday with Miss Kelly Ripa. So much fun. Once a week? She's, Once a, week? she's the instructor. <laughs> <laughs> We have our little date. Yeah, well, every Friday. Um, and then I do weights, you know, twice, twice a week. Maybe some elliptical 
a jog now and then if it's nice. Neil, I see. I love biking. Sammy, you, I see photos of you oh. in gyms all over Los Angeles. Ah! Really? <laughs> no, you sent me. It was a great I, photo. I love. Yeah, I'm more into sort of the CrossFit sort of practical strength. I'm less into lifting weight, 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 and more into into keeping my body fit and and flexible and lean. I wish I was a better. I keep bringing it back to Hamilton, mm -hmm. but when I watch those dancers in Hamilton and the way they can move, and it's a little bit hip hop, but it has such great body awareness, and I feel so retarded. <laughs> I'm just like, my body doesn't move at the same ways at the same time when I'm just freely dancing. So I want to have, I want, I'm always trying to get body awareness. Plus, plus with jobs that I'm taking, I, I shift my, I try to shape my body a lot. So for Hedwig, uh, when I did that a couple years back, I, I lost. Hey. I wanted to be very feminine because I was, I was playing Hedwig, who was a woman, and, and so I lost 23 pounds or something. I was From like, this frame? Yeah, I was 148 pounds or something in that. You can see the bones in his back. Oh. It was hot. Oh. And Count Olaf in this, what I'm doing right now, um, I want him to be very... Uh, angular. Yeah, angular and sort of round and long, you know, long and sinewy. So, you know, um, here's a good visual. Uh, the Cirque du Soleil show O in yes. Vegas. The yes. water show, is yes. anyone familiar yes. with that one? Yes. At all ish? So there's a, one of the main images is sort of a, a guy yes, on an exactly. umbrella and he's sort of the black and white sort of older clown and he's very frowny, but everything is just very sort of hunched over and sort of pointed. So I'm trying to get my body to be very like long and round. <laughs> I'm weird. Weird. Is there a gym for that? <laughs> <laughs> if there is, there's one in New York City. No, I Equinox, I, I have a, a trainer, Equinox. Alex, who's great, and he's been doing a lot of stuff called Animal Flow, which Equinox actually does. Really? which is uh, sort of being in sort of uh, animalish positions, almost cat-cow, you know, the mm -hmm, cat-cow sure. thing, but with your knees are up, and then from that you can take movements forward they and They have these different names for, there's, you know, the, the crawling beast and the gecko and all of these different things you can do to sort of different parts of your body. This is so much more interesting than the presidential debate, by the way. <laughs> I think so. All right, I got a couple more, then we're gonna finish. All right, travel. <laughs> Beach or ski? Beach. Beach. Oh, me too. Uh, management of time. Last minute or well ahead? <laughs> <laughs> well ahead. Last minute. <laughs> really? God. Our lives are just, there. there's, it's You're constantly, last minute, I, I'm not by be? choice. <laughs> I'm just, uh, th things change so much and I've, and we keep trying to set things on a schedule that's set and then it doesn't change. <laughs> and our, you get your expectations one way. And the one thing I'm learning in life at 43 is that the expectations will, will kill you. To expectations! Yeah! <laughs> no, they're the one thing. If, you think, if you're expecting your friends that come over to be behaving a certain way and they're not, you're upset at them. If you're expecting dinner to go a certain way and it's not. If you're expecting your spouse to come home and be a certain way and they're not. If you're expecting your kids to have done... Like, you're, and you, I'm trying so hard to just know that whatever's happening when it's happening is happening and it's it's your responsibility to process it as it's happening so i guess that would make things sort of last minute you know all right i'm a i'm a planner though yeah, i list you are you're a chef that's and why. i need lists and i you're need to know this and that and a b c i'm the same way and when things get off i have to uh, brain red lights sirens so if you're and our life is fucking crazy <laughs> It's always changing. It's always not. So if there's, a, if there's a six o'clock flight, you and I are there at three o'clock getting manicures, right? At, yeah. Okay. Do you get to the airport super early? Three hours early. Really? It kills my wife. Oh, I'm not that crazy. No. Why? Sometimes we go in separate cars. I just, I, I freak out about missing a flight. Wow. Yeah. And what happens if you miss a flight? I never do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's an interesting one. Audrey Hepburn. Breakfast really? at Tiffany's oh. or Funny Face? I thought she was asking the question. <laughs> oh, I say Funny Face because her at, in those dance sequences with uh, Gene I Kelly. Uh, Amazing. No, Fred Astaire. Sorry, Fred Astaire. Are just unbelievable. Funny it's face. just, yeah, Funny Face. 
Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah. Uh, cartoons, Looney Tunes, or Mickey Mouse Clubhouse? Oh, I have to say Looney Tunes, because they're so, they're so whack, they're so wrong. <laughs> they're so twisted. Yeah, Mel Blanc bo voiced a lot, most of the voices in those, and he was so good at being so everybody, and those were sort of Darker, old school, very darker. But old I'm school. such a Disney fan, so. And it, I mean, I watch. It's that weird robot. It's, it's it's not hand drawn. I like those new Mickey Mouse cartoons that they no. have that you can watch. Oh yeah, the really old school one, hardcore like and creepy and spastic. Those are fun. But it's weird to watch Goofy like it's a Mickey Mouse clubhouse <laughs> and they're just dancing in these weird <laughs> CG. God, we Mickey watched a ways. lot of those though. Yeah, the kids children. were really into those right yeah. when they started watching TV and like two. All right, this is the last one. Uh, it's about singing. Oh. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, you both sing. -ish. Yes. Who's the better singer? Oh. David. You're the better singer, David. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> <clears throat> he studied musical theater in college. I didn't go to college. So <clears throat> he, yeah, he's, he's got a higher range than I do. For okay, me. so singing, uh, in the shower or in the rain? I don't like the rain so much. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't. But Gene Kelly doing it on the lamppost Nothing is like so it. cool. That's a great question. In I gotta shower? say singing in the shower because- The vibe, the echo. Yeah, you it's sound good really acoustics. good in the shower. <laughs> Good acoustics. I'm really good at Hamilton in the shower. <laughs> like, I could win awards for that. I'm not singing He's any so of the better. right words. You, you but know, I sound you know really everything good. to Hamilton, though. I know everything. And our my son is crazy. Our, yeah. our, our, our kids, too. too. Our son is like nuts about it. Nuts about it. Anyway, there's this new show. You should try and get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Hamilton. Just go up to the box office. Say you want eight tickets, it'll be fine. Guys, that is all I got. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Patrick Harris, David Berker, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jazeem. Thank you, Jazeem. Make it easy.